Hello, my name is Richard Cooper. I'm one of the research directors at Ampere Analysis. And I'm going to be talking to you today about new and emergent themes for 2021 in kids SFOD. Now, just to begin, a quick introduction to Ampere Analysis. Uh, we are an independent global media analysis company, and we track media consumption and provision across all content windows for movies, TV content, and games. So what that means is that we've got a holistic view of the TV, movie, and games industry, tracking content revenue generation throughout a product's life cycle. Now, the way that we do this is through our suite of products, and these break down to three categories. Uh, the first in the blue is our consumer tracking service, where we poll broadband households across 25 markets twice a year. Now that tracks consumers' media consumption habits and their access to that content. Now the second grouping in the yellow are our markets products. These products track and forecast key performance indicators, uh, such as revenue generation, subscriptions and increasingly content spend for over 90 markets worldwide. And then finally, in the pink, we have our analytics suite of products, which track title availability via VOD and linear platforms in 49 countries. Now, within our analytics products, we also have uh, commissioning. Now, this particular pro product tracks newly commissioned TV shows as they're announced, uh, recording content that's due to appear on uh, linear and VOD services over the course of the next uh, 6 to 18 months. Now, to begin the presentation, let's talk about what happened to kids commissioning through 2020 and into 2021. So in the chart that we're looking at here, uh, this tracks the volume of children's titles which have been commissioned over the course of the last 24 months. So these are titles that were commissioned a full year before the pandemic and from March of 2020, the titles that were commissioned during the pandemic. Now, the first thing that you'll notice is that the bars on the right-hand side of this graphic are on the whole a little larger than those on the left, so you can immediately see that the impact of the pandemic has been to increase the volume of children's content commissions. Now, some of those commissions were for COVID-specific titles, and by that I mean that they were titles focused on the pandemic itself, or titles shot using uh, lockdown-friendly formats. Now, for the purposes of analysis within this presentation, I specifically excluded those titles as they kind of sit outside of the normal run of commissions and are very unlikely to be renewed for subsequent seasons. So if we break out that 24 month period into four equal six month groupings, we can start to see some of the changes that have occurred as a result of the pandemic, but also those trends that has existed ahead of the pandemic and have been accentuated as a result of it. Uh, the pie chart on this slide shows the key genre breakdowns of children's content commissioned over this period. So on the far left hand side, a full six months before the onset of the pandemic, you can see that animation in the blue accounted for two thirds of all children's content that was commissioned. The remaining third was made up of a selection of live action genres. However, in the next pie chart, in the next six months leading up to that pandemic, that picture almost reversed with a little over 40% of uh, title commissions being animation and the remaining 60% being between uh, those live action genres weighted towards science and education, uh, drama and sci-fi and fantasy titles. Now, looking at the third pie chart from the left-hand side, um, this is the first lockdown. Uh, we can see the genre split of commissions was largely unchanged early on in the pandemic. And this is despite the fact that the volume of titles had increased by half as much again. However, in the most six, recent six months, labelled here as the new normal, on the right-hand side, you can see the erosion of animation as a genre within children's commissioning. Live action content now accounts for two thirds of original commission titles, with an even heavier weighting towards science and education, along with comedy titles. Now, if we map this split between animation and live action over the course of that two time, uh, we can see increases in both uh, live action and animation and immediately after the onset of the pandemic. However, as linear providers particularly uh, began to see shortfalls in TV schedules, it was live action titles with their comparatively short production life cycles that began to be commissioned in greater volumes. Now, this was in order to swiftly fill those scheduling gaps. Now, though that number has fallen in the most recent quarter, the volume of commissions here remains ahead of what it would have been even a couple of years ago. 
Now moving back to that monthly view of children's commissioning and now splitting it by the commissioning platforms uh, with linear commissions here marked in the blue and video on demand, um, so streamer commissioning marked in the orange, uh, you can see that the very much that the uptick in children's commissioning over the course of the last 12 months being entirely due to the linear commissioners. Now the number of direct uh, commissions of children's original content by VOD players is more or less flat or, or even in decline over that period. Now this isn't indicative of a declining market, far from it. It's more an increasing admission on the part of many of the streamers uh, that original children's content remains an incredibly elusive component compared to other aspects of their catalogue. And this really reinforces that streamers on the whole are very reliant on third-party acquisitions in order to maintain their catalogues. So how is kids streaming changing um, over that time? Well, firstly, for the most part, uh, the key players within this arena, in Western Europe at least, aren't changing very much. Um, in terms of the volume of subscribers, uh, as you can see from the chart, Netflix and Amazon continue to dominate the Western European market compared to their local competitors. Now, the largest of these local competitors, certainly by the end of our forecast period, uh, which is 2026 in this case, um, is Viaplay. Um, but they still only have less than 10% the number of subscribers that Netflix do. Now, what's missing from this chart is the myriad of smaller players underneath Viaplay. Now, this is a lot of the local streaming services that are focused on single markets. Now, I've missed them off deliberately in this chart to keep it relatively straightforward, um, but this is quite significant that unlike the USA, a very large single language market, there are no mid-tier players developing to fill that gap between the leading local streamers and the international market leaders. Now, the key challenger to what is otherwise a very stable market is Disney+, Plus, who are likely to hit 24 million subscribers in Western Europe by the end of the year. And they're going to continue to grow quite aggressively over the course of our forecast period, um, reaching Netflix-like proportions by uh, the end of 2026. Uh, now, I have very carefully avoided talking about Apple TV Plus on this slide, and you'll see why shortly. Uh, I re really categorise Apple TV Plus as a traditional SVOD service. It's better characterised really as a service aggregator uh, rather than a platform in its own right. Uh, the focus, as with a lot of uh, Apple TV uh, products, is really around device sales and drawing consumers into the Apple ecosystem. Um, but it would have been very remiss of me if I hadn't listed them, at least, uh, when talking about subscribers. So using the UK here as an example of a European market, I'm showing the title count for each of these major SVOD services present in the UK. So this is the title count of children's content on their services. Now you can immediately see why I'm choosing to exclude Apple TV, given the size of their children's catalogue. Um, but overall, when we uh, compare the sizes of these catalogues uh, present during the first quarter of 2020 and 2021, for the most part, you can see that we've seen catalogue increases. Now, this is very evident for Disney Plus and for Netflix. Uh, however, Amazon Prime has, a, has declined in size, uh, despite being the largest provider of children's content of any of the platforms available in the UK. Now, interestingly, the overall size of Amazon Prime's catalogue has declined at a marginally faster rate than the drop that we can see here for children's content. So what this does is actually raise the importance of children's content as a component within that catalogue. Now, lastly, we have uh, Sky's Now service. Now, it's a heavily managed catalogue, uh, which has by design more or less maintained its size, both in terms of the children's content that's available through it and, of course, other genres as well. Now, if we broaden that first quarter view to uh, include other European video on demand platforms, you can see that SVOD dominate in terms of catalogue size. However, the European broadcasters, labelled here as catch up services, although arguably best described as broadcaster led video on demand, so BVOD, carry significant volumes of children's content. Now, this is particularly the likes of BBC's iPlayer and SVT Play. Now, it's perhaps a little difficult to read on this chart, but next to all of the label names at the bottom, I've given a proportion of the catalogue which is comprised of children's content. And you can clearly see that among the main players, uh, for the most part, the share is in the high teens or above. Now, Disney's the rather obvious exception to this, uh, with around a half of their catalogue being specifically focused at children's entertainment. 
However, if we look at the volume of original direct commissions by SVOD services, you can see incredibly low volumes of original content being added over the course of that 24 month period. Now, in this, uh, in the, the case of Western Europe, that's just 51 titles commissioned between April of 2019 and March of 2020. And just over half of those titles were commissioned by just two platforms, KU in France and France Television. So what that means in real terms is that in order to maintain those very significant catalogues of children's content, the streamers are incredibly fo focused on third-party acquisitions for all of it. Now, from a producer or distributor, from a producer or distributor's point of view, uh, that certainly isn't a bad thing. So what we are able to do uh, using Ampere Analytics. Uh, SVOD service um, is to identify uh, how the composition of those children's catalogues has changed. Now the chart on the left in the centre of this slide uh, tracks those changes over the course of the last six months. Now the labels that you can see listed down the left hand side are Amazon's own categories. The genre tagging that they use to describe the content available on their service. So this is Amazon's categorizations rather than Ampere's. Now, they are listed here by the number of times that they're repeated within the service. So a single title is very likely to have multiple genre tags. So Amazon may have listed a title as being a mystery, a teen show, and as a classic detective story and based on a book. So they were, therefore, we've got more tags counted here than individual titles available. Nevertheless, this does give a very good indication as to the types of titles that are available through the service and the kind of combinations that are going to be important to Amazon using their own language. So what we're seeing here are just the 15, the top 15 genre tags. And with that, it's covering around 81% of all the titles available within Amazon's children's catalogue. Now to read these charts, um, in orange, we've got those titles which remained on the service. So these are those that have been um, consistent across that six month period in terms of their availability. In the blue, we've got those titles which were added to the service and in grey, those that were removed. Now, by indexing the difference between those titles removed and those added, we can provide uh, an assessment of how likely it is Amazon will be interested in acquiring specific types of content. So the chart on the right hand side of this slide does exactly that and provides a percentage figure highlighting the relative level of interest Amazon is likely to have in content that matches that specific genre tagging. So the way to read this is firstly that uh, at the very top of the chart on the uh, in the centre, mystery titles are very important to Amazon uh, with it having uh, the largest bar. Now, having lost a significant number of those titles over the course of the last six months, they're quite likely to want to replace them in order to maintain the balance of their catalogue. Now, as you can see on the chart on the right hand side, there is a small bar with 5% marked next to it. Now, that indicates the level of interest that Amazon are likely to have. However, uh, there are some sub more significant bars uh, within that chart, and given the importance of recognisable intellectual property within kids' content, I would suggest Amazon would be more likely to welcome titles that could carry that classic genre tag, particularly if it's a classic mystery and be could be classed as an independent or short. Now, we can do similar analysis of Netflix's catalogue, and it reveals a somewhat different set of genre tags, but again covering uh, in the top 15 genre tags listed here around 80% of their children's catalogue. Now, this chart suggests if you have a teen or tween mystery based on an award-winning book, Netflix are likely to be interested in acquiring that content. Uh, certainly more interested in that content uh, than perhaps a darkly comedic period children's sitcom um, if such things exist. Now, with Disney+, Plus, much of their content is, is very new and nothing, well, a couple of titles have been removed from their service over the course of the last six months. However, here too we can use that same gap analysis. So what we can see is a large proportion of Disney Plus's catalogue has been tagged with tween, but there's been very few additions to this genre over the course of the last six months. So it's going to be an area that Disney Plus are likely to want to continue to fill. Uh, and in this case, uh, as is anime, or perhaps um, classic preschool superhero stories based on a book. But by the look of this, they're going to be avoiding uh, mysteries and detective stories for quite some time. 
Sky's Now catalogue in the UK is, as I've indicated, a heavily managed service with more of a one-in-one-out type system of category management. Uh, recent additions include a large proportion of factual content, so perhaps in another six months' time they're going to be looking to replace that, but for now they're likely to be interested in anime-style mysteries targeted at tween audiences with perhaps underlying themes of friendship. Now pushing a little deeper into those titles that were commissioned in Western Europe, so that's around 151 titles over the 24-month period, now we can do some more thematic analysis of those titles. So firstly, let's remind ourselves of the significant shift away from animation towards live action uh, content, albeit driven by those short production time scales associated with live action needed to fill the linear schedules. Curiously, within children's content, uh, we haven't seen a significant uptick in unscripted entertainment or documentary as a result of the pandemic. Uh, you can see from the chart here in the orange that there has been some increase in unscripted content, but really it pales into comparison when we compare to non-children's content, where the commissioning of entertainment and documentary programming has nearly doubled um, over the course of that 24-month period. Furthermore, within that 150 titles commissioned over uh, that period, there's actually relatively few overarching themes. Children's content commissioning has been particularly diverse. So the typical tags do appear. Uh, many titles are adapted from pre-existing intellectual property. Uh, anthropomorphic characters, obviously stemming from that declining animation grouping, as well as key uh, female and male protagonist tags. But there's very few other particularly prevalent themes evident within that commissioned original content. In terms of diversity for gender uh, within children's content, there have been some sizable shifts over that 24-month period that we've been assessing. Now, the pie chart on the far left-hand side represents a full 12 months ahead of the pandemic, uh, whereas the other two pie charts in the centre and right look at six-month periods. So, at the beginning of lockdown uh, and the most recent six six-month period uh, ending in April of 2021. So what we can see on the left ahead of the pandemic uh, is that just under half the titles with a gender identified protagonists uh, were male-led with just under 40 percent with a female lead. Now with the onset of the pandemic this gender imbalance immediately worsened with nearly 60 percent of all commissioned um, titles featuring a male lead and just less than a quarter featuring a uh, solo female lead. However, over the course of the last six months, gender diversity within those commission titles has been somewhat restored, with a, a more or less roughly equal volumes of male and female-led commissions. What has also changed over the course of the pandemic is the age ranges to which these originally commissioned titles are being targeted. Now, ahead of the pandemic, uh, there was a real focus on school-aged children, with, so uh, five to nine-year-olds with around a third targeted at preteens and just 18% at teenagers. Now, in the first six months of the pandemic, this began to shift quite radically, with greater proportions directed at the teenage and preteen market, with a significant reduction in school-aged children commissioning. Now, in the most recent six months, we've seen those shares almost turned on their heads, with shows directed at teenagers and preteens with around 24% of commissions each, with just 16% um, targeted at school-aged children. Now, a key contributor to this is likely to be the shift away from animation towards live-action content that we looked at earlier within the presentation. What we've also seen is a fairly significant shift in the proportion of titles which stem from pre-existing intellectual property. Now, over the course of the pandemic, we saw a drop-off in the volume of adaptations within children's content, with a considerable rise in the uh, commissioning of titles that use new and original content brands. Now, even as we move into the most recent quarter, um, that trend is still uh, relatively evident and very slow to correct, so it's likely to remain with us for quite some time. Now, as previously mentioned, there have been a few, um, well, few rather persistent underlying themes uh, in commissioning over the last 24 months. Uh, we can, as you can see from the chart on the left hand side, seen a drop off in those anthropomorphic characters, you know, again linked to the declines in animation commissioning uh, from the SFL services. Now, there's also been something of a reversal in what had previously been an accelerating trend in spin offs, remakes, and reboots from the streamers' commissioning of children's content. 
Now, for those of us of a certain age, it's probably something of a relief, uh, with quite so much of the content that we enjoyed as children being repackaged and, some might say, ruined for the next generation. So uh, I'm going to let you pass your own judgement on the teaser trailer for Netflix's remake of the classic uh, He-Man cartoons, so uh, no spoilers from me here. But we are going to focus uh, a little bit more on animation. So uh, we have seen uh, a decline in direct commissioning of animation, but the category remains an incredibly important part of the third party market for children's content, and so no less important to the streamers themselves. On the chart on the left hand side of this page, we can see the availability of Western European originating animation available via Western European video on demand services. And you can see that over the course of that three year period, so that's from April uh, 2019, uh, there's been a substantial increase in the volume of European animation being made available through the streamers. Now the chart here indicates the volume of content hours that are available uh, via those streaming services and then splits it uh, on a country of origin basis. Now what you can see is that for Western Europe the market is really dominated by France and the UK but over the course of that period all territories have recorded increase in the volume of content hours being made available. Now if we pivot that chart to look at the proportion of hours stemming from each of these countries, we can see that there's been a greater level of acceleration in the volume of content hours stemming from France, Germany and other European countries. Now whilst the volume of content hours stemming from the UK has increased, as a proportion of overall content it's beginning to lose out, growing slower than in other markets and particularly over the course of the last year or so. Now, we can perform the same gap analysis on children's animation as we did for those individual streaming services earlier on. Now, within this chart, we're using a mix of Ampere's own genres and those key streaming service genre tagging um, as before. Now, this is in order to maximise the volume of titles being covered by this analysis. Now, as you can see for those primary genres of action and adventure, comedy, and science fiction and fantasy well served, uh, with uh, anime particularly as a specific growth category uh, within many of the uh, streamers. Now it's still very much in demand, uh, but animated tween dramas or crime and thriller titles uh, may also find some resonance within the content that streamers are seeking to acquire. Now I'm just going to finish with a very short summary of the overall presentation. So we've seen an increase in the volume of children's commissioning since the beginning of the pandemic and this, um, as this becomes the new normal, uh, higher levels of children's content commissioning are likely to remain in place for the immediate future. Uh, linear commissioners still account for the lion's share of direct original commissioning, whereas SVOD services are likely to be ever more focused on third party content acquisitions in order to fulfil their catalogue needs. Now, with linear commissioners struggling to fill TV schedules, shorter production timescales associated with live action content have led it to dominate in recent commissioning. Now, with animation uh, subsequently uh, falling away over the course of the pandemic. Now, there is an increasing demand for animated uh, children's titles produced in and for Western European markets. Now, this is um, from the streamers as well as linear providers. And both of those demands are driven by the pandemic and an increased level of competition resulting from the launch of those US studio-backed services. That's brought me to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening.